I'm Dr. Alin Stefan Constantin. I'm a member of the uh, Young EEL team and today I'll be your host for the first interview for our first newsletter. And today's guest is no one else but the honorary president of the European Endometriosis League, Professor Hans Tinenberg. Welcome. Good afternoon. After 15 years as director of the obstetrics and gynecology clinic in University of Gießen, Germany, uh, you were supposed to enjoy your retirement, but you decided to go on. And since 2018, uh, you're with Professor Engel, the chief of the obstetrics and gynecology clinic in Northwest Hospital in Frankfurt. And together you managed to establish a very successful endometriosis center, which is since 2019 certified by EEL and the German uh, Endometriosis Foundation. Today we'll try to find out uh, more about the past, the present and future of endometriosis from your point of view, definitely. Um, let's start with the, the past. Very early in your professional life you got to deal with two things, minimal invasive surgery and endometriosis. Uh, one of your, your first academic teacher was Professor Kurt Sem, one of the pioneers of minimal invasive surgery. And on the 13th of September 1980, he performed the world's first laparoscopic appendectomy at the University of Kiel in Germany, and you were his assistant. How did you manage to assist this avant-premier? <laughs> Well, first of all, I mean, let me thank you very much for interviewing me. It's, um, it's not only very nice, but it's also a privilege uh, to be interviewed. Secondly, when you want to find out a little more about my past, too, I have to admit I never wanted to become a gynecologist. I always wanted to become a cardiologist. But since at that time it was difficult to get um, a proper appointment uh, in a university, uh, hospital which uh, was supposed to offer the best quality. Uh, I therefore joined um, the uh, University of Kiel Department of Gynecology Obstetrics where I had my uh, doctoral thesis and after that with also with uh, a topic in immunology I had um, a research scholarship in Newcastle Australia and uh, I was attractive for this department and I said to myself it's always good to have some knowledge about endocrinology and about women. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, consequently, I ended up <laughs> becoming a gynecologist and Professor Zem, who enjoyed my knowledge of English language at that time, it was uh, not so common that uh, people were quite fluent in English. And uh, uh, as you mentioned already, he was the pioneer of endoscopic surgery. And so everybody in this department was supposed to enroll in this subject. And since I was his private assistant, um, I was also during this uh, historical um, operation of the first appendicectomy worldwide, I was the one who was carrying a heavy camera on my shoulder, uh, this size, uh, so that it was uh, videotaped and he had uh, a very good uh, section of uh, this hospital that was dealing with PR, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, comics and uh, with video presentation. And therefore, um, at that time, of course, I was not aware of uh, this surgery or this operation being uh, a, uh, an operation that would change paradigms in medicine. But after that, and uh, I'm very grateful for Professor Sem, uh, that he uh, got me involved because I was not really inclined. It was heavy work uh, mm -hmm. doing this. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, sometimes you find out later what, what is good for you in life. Okay. So, uh, we <coughs> cleared up the first point uh, from your professional career the minimal invasive surgery. Uh, how about endometriosis? How did you get to deal with it? Yeah, well again Sam and I took some photos along. This is uh, one of the very nice photos of, um, of uh, Kurt Sam. Uh, he was not only uh, a pioneer with respect to minimal invasive surgery, but also with endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And it was him and two other Germans, uh, among them Professor Schweppe, <coughs> who established uh, the German Endometriosis Foundation. Uh, 
Okay. And uh, at that time, you uh, would have some high interest on, on an amount of money, and therefore, uh, certain measures like uh, establishing a, uh, a monthly journal of endometriosis could be established. Okay. Nowadays, we know <coughs> definitely more uh, about endometriosis, definitely not enough. Um, what was known back in the days? in the 70s, 80s, about endometriosis? Well, as you know, um, endometriosis was first discovered in uh, the uh, uh, late 19th uh, century and uh, the knowledge that people had there was more based on histology. Mm -hmm. um, the disease as such um, remained fairly unknown and uh, I remember that I've seen quite a number of uh, doctors, even gynecologists, that said, uh, I, I know about endometriosis from textbooks, but I've never seen any. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, as you know, <coughs> by your own experience, this is absolutely not true. Uh, but it's, uh, it is true that you can only see what you know. And uh, therefore, uh, it, uh, it needed and it still needs a lot of um, uh, creating awareness so that more health professionals, including doctors, but also midwives and nurses and, and other people, uh, would know the symptoms and the appearance of endometriosis. But um, when I started getting involved with endometriosis, which was uh, with or under SEM, um, uh, it, it was still a fairly unknown disease. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> you were there when the technology started to develop for <coughs> minimal invasive surgery. Um, which ones do you think were the game changers when it comes to the minimal invasive therapy for endometriosis? This is a tricky question. Um, because uh, the minimal invasive surgery expanded into many areas. And even though the surgeons, the visceral surgeons, f first were opposing SEM, they finally joined his idea and they uh, stepped back and said, you were right by, by doing this, by including, by doing this appendicectomy. But still, it took a long time before uh, uh, minimal invasive surgery uh, moved from a diagnostic tool into a therapeutic tool. And uh, you will remember that it took quite some time um, for, uh, for gynecologists uh, to perform a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, which by our standards right now is a very simple, straightforward uh, operation. And uh, what we experience now, and that there I'm very happy that we can closely collaborate uh, with uh, respect to deep infiltrating uh, endometriosis. This is from the point of view of uh, difficulty in performing the surgery, because it's also more interdisciplinary, getting into visceral surgery, into uh, uh, urology, and sometimes also going into neurosurgery. Uh, it involves uh, a, a good management of um, the uh, minimal invasive techniques. And this, of course, is challenging, but on the other hand, it's also hindering the widespread application. And I think when you ask for wh who was or what was the game changer, it was the, the further extent of uh, uh, operations that could be achieved by minimal invasive surgery, including hysterectomy, including using the retroperitoneal space. Yeah. Because, first of all, it started doing uh, the Wertheim procedures that w were regarded as super radical. But then one realized, if I can do a, a Wertheim procedure, then I can also move further into the retroperitoneal space. I can mobilize uh, the rectum or the rectosigmoid and, and go on from there. Okay. Um. How about uh, diagnosis? Nowadays we have ultrasound in the first line, we have <coughs> MRI, uh, transrectal ultrasound. Um, how did you diagnose back in the days the endometriosis? 
Um, honestly speaking, it was hardly ever diagnosed. It was uh, um, a finding by accident. Mm -hmm. And it was found out uh, by uh, laparoscopy, by diagnostic laparoscopy, because everybody could see the peritoneal implants. And uh, since there were so many patients with endometriosis seen, it was said, well, this is not a disease, this is common, mm -hmm. this is the norm. There are less patients without endometriosis than patients with endometriosis. But this was only peritoneal endometriosis. Okay. But then uh, we started doing ovarian surgery. And I still remember that Sam, together with Lilo Mettler uh, and myself, went to the US and had the first uh, laparoscopy courses over there, where people um, could not really believe when we were telling them that we do ovarian surgery, removing cysts. They thought this was just a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. But as you know, meanwhile, this is, uh, this is uh, one of the, the minor difficulty uh, degrees uh, surgery. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, um, it was quite apparent that there's also deep infiltrating endometriosis and adenomyosis. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, uh, the MRI and uh, X-ray, CAT scan were not really helpful. The quality of ultrasound in those days was also not uh, very good. So it was easy to pick up ovarian endometriomas, but not deep infiltrating endometriosis. And what we experience right now, and where you are also one of the experts uh, doing this, thanks to Katarina Exacusto, um, this is a completely different quality and I'm very happy to see that we could also establish this in this institution that uh, there is a great reliability of ultrasound demonstrating clearly where the implant is and how far the extent is into other organs. <coughs> um. I think lots of us are quite uh, um, curious about the beginnings of EL. How was it founded? What was before EL? Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah. Um, I can't remember when it was exactly, but uh, since we <coughs> realized that we need more awareness for the disease of endometriosis. Um, the the uh, company Takeda asked uh, some experts in endometriosis, including Sam and Schweppe, and I was one of the younger ones, <coughs> to form the Endometriosis uh, Information Center. And uh, this was sponsored by the company, and uh, we informed um, doctors and, and other health uh, professionals. And uh, it finally was found out that uh, due to increasing compliance regulations in industry, but this is a long time ago, that uh, the sponsoring of European Endometriosis Information uh, Center was no longer um, possible because it would have created many problems. So we said, okay, then we form a uh, a society and uh, at that time I had been in this field for quite some time already and uh, uh, I was luckily enough uh, in a position of participating in all the discussions and it was my suggestion to not have only a, a German society but a European society and uh, since at that time I was absolutely convinced that also others than doctors should be allowed to enter this because creating awareness means also that uh, um, non-doctors have to be multiplicators um, to explain what the disease is all about. So we called it the European Endometriosis League. And of course there was another factor and it was that um, if you start forming uh, a society you are responsible not only content-wise, but also financially. And so there were some people that were saying, oh, 
Hans, uh, you, you, you can do it. Uh, and uh, I, I happily did it and I'm, I'm very happy to see how it, uh, it developed over the years. Okay. Because I remember uh, a couple of years ago I was in uh, Vienna for the, uh, one of our workshops, the Congress, <coughs> School of Endometriosis, and I remember you were very excited that there were, there were so many uh, attendees, and uh, I think you said uh, at the beginnings of the EL, these were all the people, or so, so many persons, were in the room for the whole Congress. So I think in the last uh, years, decades, uh, things have developed and uh, 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 it was managed uh, that the awareness for endometriosis uh, uh, was raised. Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, um, the, the first true European Congress uh, we, we offered was uh, yes, with uh, the assistance and the great support of uh, Felice Petralia. And uh, Felice said, uh, let's do it in Siena. Uh, at that time, I, I didn't know where Siena is, uh, uh, even though it's, it's a wonderful city, a uh, terrific environment, but it does not have a very good uh, connection mm -hmm. uh, traffic-wise. And um, uh, we offered this and uh, uh, we uh, saw many more pe uh, people coming so that all the the premises the the lecture hall it was packed with people we had another lecture hall and still um, it was enough. overboarding yeah it was in a hotel because we didn't want to run uh, too much of uh, uh, a monetary risk but this was a great success and from there on it continued uh, to develop to be um, a great success and i also understand there is a great need for an institution to explain not only what endometriosis is but how to deal with endometriosis and um, uh, to get some assistance in, in performing uh, this. And uh, this is what EL is also about. It's not only scientific but also practical application. Like the master classes that were organized, including the master classes, uh, where there is direct application, including ultrasound courses, where people are taught how to 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 see and to do things. It. Yeah. So I guess we managed quite a lot in the last uh, uh, decades regarding endometriosis diagnostic therapy. Um, how do you see the present? The present, well, the present is much better than uh, whatever was before but still <clears throat> and uh, I think you just mentioned this um, uh, some time before uh, we still face that there is a long lag time before onset of disease and diagnosis and that means that um, we need education of patients which are not patients we need education of uh, all lay people all women but also men to understand the disease, but also we need to, under, to educate doctors, not only gynecologists, but also GPs. Because uh, if someone has pain somewhere, it could be endometriosis, definitely if it's in, in a, a circadian uh, rhythm. And uh, this is what, uh, what we need to realize at present. And if you may ask me, so what's, what about the future? The future lies in your hands, not in the hands of <laughs> elderly people like me. And uh, um, that's why I'm happy that you and, and the other young forum of EEL are so enthusiastic about doing this. And uh, you have established uh, the social media um, uh, putting forward that the, all these uh, ideas can be uh, shared. But we also do have new techniques in genetics and uh, in uh, biochemistry, in lab science. I trust that it probably will not take too long before we have other markers that can tell us where there is endometriosis and where not. And secondly, these markers might also indicate what therapy will be required. I'm absolutely convinced that we will in the future always need surgery 
but we might also have other tools uh, to, um, uh, to help these poor women that suffer from endometriosis. Not only to get rid of pain, but also to fulfill their desire to have a child. So you mean like early diagnostic uh, in the future? Well, once the diagnosis is earlier than it is now, we have much better ways to treat patients. Mm -hmm. But also we are aware of possible problems that this particular woman is subjected to. Because one of the things that, that's bothering me is that we see so many patients who have been suffering for like many years. The medium delay is between 7 to 11 years bef between the beginning of the symptoms and the diagnosis. Uh, do you think one of the things we should do uh, would be to raise awareness among teenagers in schools, for example, among raising awareness uh, 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 between the doctors? I think the entire society needs to be taught. And uh, um, many years back, we did a survey in a, a big department store. And this department store um, was mainly run by women. Women were uh, sales, uh, shop assistants, uh, selling stuff. And uh, we were asking, what do you think about your colleague when she is staying home because of menstrual pain? And most of these women had no sympathy for these uh, colleagues uh, that had to stay back home. And you know there are quite a number of studies also showing what, what deficit uh, in economics uh, is due to this, this regular uh, problem. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that we need to make sure that uh, the society knows uh, what uh, endometriosis is like and that uh, heavy menstrual pain is not normal as is still handed over by mothers to children so, so that uh, the, the wrong indicators uh, are being set. And secondly, of course, we also know that there is still uh, a major lack of knowledge within our professional group. And uh, not everybody needs to be an endometriosis surgeon or whatsoever, but they have to know what they have to do and where they can send uh, people to do so. And uh, as you know, we are here in a metropolitan area, but still there are only very few people that are interested in endometriosis and, and less people even that are dealing with it knowingly and competently. I think th this is one of the main things that we have to emphasize that pain during period yeah. it's not normal not only for the whole society but also for the doctors yeah. because unfortunately unfortunately we, we get to see lots of patients saying I thought this is normal that's what my mother told me uh, my sister has this as well and uh, yeah. isn't it normal and then there's another group of patients saying yeah my doctor told me uh, it's normal it's your period yeah. it's supposed to hurt but yeah okay thank you very much professor Tienberg, for having you here it was a my pleasure, pleasure my and pleasure. An honor Mm -hmm. uh, and for everybody back home, thank you for uh, watching us. Uh, stay safe, take care, and don't forget to subscribe to EL social media, follow our website for the latest updates. Thank you very much. Bye bye.